Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, really appreciate everybody's continued interest in the forum, even though we can't be together. I'm a part of an honored panel to talk about national and regional networks responses to COVID-19. I'm from Kansas City, or as it's known as Inland, um, from a comedian friend of mine, Mary Mack, and uh, representing, I'll be talking about Cornet, and then Matvi Palchuk from Trinetics will be talking about Trinetics efforts. Jack London uh, joins us and we'll be talking about cancer-related uh, network efforts. And then Sean Murphy and uh, Doug McFadden uh, joining us from the Boston area will be talking about the accrual to clinical trials effort. Uh, in the interest of time, we will do questions after all the panelists present. So as Diane has reminded us, uh, using the chat or the uh, Q&A uh, box is much appreciated. So I'm gonna present the core network, which I think many of you on the call are involved with. Uh, and uh, this work is largely also uh, very synergistic and my slides are pulled often from the work of Tom Carton, Keith Marcello, and Jason Block. Um, I serve as a board member on ACTS and also receive honorariums from some campuses as conflicts. Again, I didn't create all these slides. They're really great work, especially by Laura Cohen, who is at Duke and is the project leader for PCORNET. Um, and these slides are also available in greater detail on PCORNET resources. So if you're interested, just let me know. I'm gonna give an introduction to PCORNET, even though many may be aware of it. We'll then talk about PCORNET efforts with regards to COVID surveillance. I'll then talk briefly about the HERO registry and HCQ trial, and then uh, have some thoughts on questions, but we can save those towards the end. Um, PCORNET, if you're not aware, is a network of networks funded by PCORI uh, for over the past five years. It's composed of clinical research networks, which are composed of health systems, it also incorporates health plans, uh, Anthem Insurance, and Humana, and patient partners. It has a coordinating center with representation largely from Duke University and Harvard. Um, and this is a map kind of representing the various uh, networks in PCORNET, which often overlap very strongly with sites that are involved with supporting I2B2. Uh, PCORNET uses a common data model, not dissimilar from uh, OMOP, though uh, notably it's based upon a data model inherited from the Sentinel FDA effort. So there's a, perhaps a little tighter alignment with Food and Drug Administration uh, surveillance models. So when PCORNET looks to respond, or you think about it, its ability to rapidly respond to COVID, it had this existing data model, which largely has a lot of data ready for research, but it could plug in additional data elements as needed. So that kind of coalesces its sites, um, but may not be available nationally. The other thing to keep in mind is it has an existing data sharing agreement between the coordinating center and all the sites, which largely allows it to rapidly uh, execute queries and SAS analytic packages that are distributed to the sites and then aggregate results returned. Another notable element for PCORNET, if you haven't followed along, is it has a quarterly quality check. Um, so in place, as you'll see on these slides, for example, when we got started back in 2014-15, um, very few people had LOINC labs ready to go, you know, labs mapped to an interoperable terminology. And quarter by quarter, that gets better and better and better of the number of sites able to provide that, as well as how many labs are getting standardized, both in volume and unique terms. The other item to note in the lower figure is there's a series of different types of checks about persistence, conformance, you know, is a data model accurately conforming to the criteria in terms of integers versus uh, floating, you know, floating points or text fields. Data completeness, you know, do we see that um, diagnosis codes have got their type specified? Is the data looking plausible? You know, do we have a lot of people who are dying in the future um, or who are dead but are having, uh, being billed for services? Um, and then is the data persistence? Do we see dramatic changes quarter by quarter in terms of the number of records reported? Um, so this is, I think, of interest to the ITP2 community, and I'll speak mainly from the perspective of Kansas and our network. Um, some of the networks in PCORNET are consolidated, where they have a single data mart that serves, say, three institutions or, or 10 institutions data up from one spot. But our network, each site in our network is its own node. Uh, and people, as everyone knows, if you've seen one data environment, you've seen one data environment. So some people do it as they do it, but um, we have shared ETL code uh, that's been adopted by several of the sites. And just looking at a Kansas model, we have EHR data that goes into an open source environment that first in our environment goes into I2B2. So we actually were, and we were approached by 4CE, we were able to respond very quickly to 4CE 
And then when PCORnet came along later wanting to do the same, we were able to quickly marshal forces and then transform the data into the PCORnet common data model. Okay, um, so details there. But here's the thing. So just to give you some timing, I, I've put in red letters some of the timing. It is just remarkable as John Wilbanks and others have been commenting and Zach in terms of 4CE, how fast people reacted. So we had a steering committee call in PCORnet on March 24th, motivated by the CDC saying, hey, can you guys help us characterize COVID positive patients? And so these, this is actually a slide from the 24th. Short term, let's see if we can track basic info and then see over time if we can track things across the disease course. And the initial idea was, could we make a standalone copy of the common data model that included only the positive patients or those with a um, uh, diagnosis code? And then we'll reissue these queries weekly so other sites will have an opportunity to join in over time. So here's what's remarkable. Well, one comment is what happened mostly at sites is they might have their big common data model up at the top. So people would filter and say, I'm just going to grab that subset that I want to update on a weekly basis and push it through here. So in our environment, we have about 2 million people in our big data warehouse, but we have about 50,000 in this COVID CDM. And notably, that was because the ask was, go ahead and get for a comparison population anybody with a variety of respiratory illnesses that we could use as a control population. So that's why it's 50,000, while we only have about uh, you know, 1,100 people who've tested positive for COVID in our medical center. Um, but it uses the same infrastructure, so we point everything against that COVID group. So that happened. And then let me get my slides going. Uh, then the next week, what will happen the next week? In one week, a huge segment of the Cornet sites were saying, I'm ready to respond, and actually had sites responding in almost a week, which was pretty remarkable, or saying they could respond in under two weeks. Same type of thing for 4CE. So it's really neat how synergistics these were. By the end of, by the beginning of May, you had the vast majority of sites across all of the Cornet participating, um, and you can see that many of them were actually responding. Um, while others were in the process of getting ready to respond. Um, again, the definitions for PCORnet have been COVID positive based on diagnosis code and test results using LOINC standards. And so every week um, we get a new set of areas that's being probed for PCORnet in terms of the, um, the types of questions that are being looked at. And then you can see time over time, the increase in the number of sites and patients available. I'll give a brief look at some of the latest results from May that were prepared last week <clears throat> on the steering committee call. We had 42 sites responding, over 30,000 patients with the diagnosis codes and the PCR test, and for comparison, over 100,000 with pneumonia and 200,000 with the flu. Um, and so here's some of the preliminary data being provided back to CDC and other partners that are interested in terms of what the breakdown is by area of uh, treatment and setting, ambulatory versus emergency room and, um, and those who are on ventilators. Um, some things of interest, PCORnet has now stratified so it can also look at the same distributions for children and see what that looks like by age. So are we noticing differences in terms of how many people we have a higher populate, a percentage of patients who are ventilated who are very young uh, versus uh, older patients. Um, and similarly, starting to look at comorbidities. What are the common comorbidities in adults uh, for this uh, population? And then also the ability to start to look at what kind of treatments are starting to be used in this population and how do those treatments vary between those diagnosed in the ambulatory setting or tested positive in the ambulatory setting to those who are, are ventilated. Um, next steps really for this surveillance work are refining information about the care setting, bringing in additional flags and uh, derived facts similar to uh, I2P2 related efforts, enhancing data validation, and then looking at a supplemental statement work for Vanguard sites to do um, additional work in ETL that would then be deployed across the broader network. Uh, there are blogs in the link slides to more information about the processes as well as codes on GitHub. So that's the data side, but what's neat about PCORnet is you've got data, you've got observational prospective, and you also have a trial. So I wanna briefly talk about the HERO trial. So um, this is a comment from the front line of a physician down in Florida who says, you know, it's hard to think that I go do my job and not only can I get sick, but I may infect those of those I love. 
Um, you know, it's a time to be proactive and think about how do you stay safe. Uh, so there's this registry, heroesresearch.org, where as a healthcare provider, if you know healthcare providers or you are one, it's an opportunity. It doesn't take much time to sign up because it's a, it's a stressful time for you as a healthcare provider. Um, and this registry is designed to quickly collect information on people who are healthcare providers um, who may be interested in just providing as much data as they can. Uh, and it'll be a platform for qualitative and quantitative research of the healthcare providers who may be at highest risk of coming down with the uh, COVID infection. What's interesting about that too is, so people sign up, you can go sign up, it's totally free, low enrollment um, effort, <clears throat> and you can participate as much as you want. And it's broad. So food service workers, we want to know about everybody. Emergency responders involved in healthcare can sign up for this registry. And then what it does is that those ins people who are at institutions that are part of PCORNET that are supporting sites, they will have an opportunity to join the HERO HCQ trial. And this is different than some other hydroxychloroquine trials. It's really to primarily evaluate, is it effective in preventing infection from the beginning? Or as you saw from the prior treatment slide, um, the drug has been used for treatment after they're ventilated or in the ventil you know, much sicker. And our goal is to <coughs> enroll 15,000 people in this trial. <clears throat> so um, this is a sense right now of how many people we have currently enrolled in the registry. <clears throat> and then down at the bottom, I have an updated slide from this week. We have over 880 uh, people at 26 sites already enrolled in the prospective trial. What is remarkable as other people have presented is the pace at which this has occurred. We went from the idea in March 21st to approval at the, end of, at the beginning of April <clears throat> to the IRB approved to the first patient randomized in almost a month which uh, I have not seen things like this happen before. And now here we are mid-May, closing in later in May, and we've got, we got many people enrolled in the study. So um, that's really, actually, I did really great on time. That's it for me. Um, we'll take on to the next speaker. And I will stop sharing. Our next speaker will be um, Matvi. Is Matvi there to take control? Yes, I am here. Wonderful. I've relinquished uh, screen dominance and you may pick it up. I will share the screen. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see my screen. Uh, this conf conference is definitely a, a prominent feature for me uh, every year. Um, and I was just doing some, some quick math and it looks like, um, it looks like uh, this is the seventh conference where I have a chance to talk about Trinetics. So uh, we've, uh, <clears throat> Jeez. We have uh, announced this, uh, announced the, the company at this conference in 2014. Um, I will get it right eventually. So we, we announced it in 2014 and uh, it's been six years. It's pretty remarkable uh, how quickly the time flies, honestly. So here's, here's what, uh, um, what I wanted to say about Trinetics before, before making other comments. Uh, I had, I had the slide, I had the slide, uh, shown before, and this is kind of my, my, uh, conception of what, what I see Trinetics as being. There are four big things that, that, that are important. Uh, Trinetics to me is an idea, it's a network, it's a data asset, and it's the capability to analyze it. And the idea is really to liberate the clinical data from primary sources and uh, to be able to put it in the hands of researchers. Uh, another foundational uh, aspect of Trinetics is that it's 
a public-private partnership that comes with a sustainability model built in. From the perspective of the network, it's not just a physical network. It's not just a bunch of databases talking to one another. We're connecting people. We're bringing together ideas. And I think that's the most exciting part of this. Uh, we've built an amazing data asset, mainly EHR based, uh, bringing in other sources, doing a whole bunch of curation, doing a lot of work on, uh, on data quality. And of course, the ability to analyze the data. Two major use cases, optimizing clinical trials, uh, as well as uh, doing, doing research. Uh, obligatory slide, I will not dwell on this uh, too long. Uh, I must say that Griffin low-balled our numbers a little bit in the morning, but uh, that's perfectly fine. We've grown pretty impressively uh, over, over these years. So 150 institutions, each one obviously comprising many more than a single hospital, uh, all across the world. Today we stand in, at 26 countries, uh, over 400 million patients. Of them, about 100 searchable on Trinetics platform, uh, another large swath of patients accessible on, uh, in other geographic areas in Europe, uh, in Asia, and uh, continuously growing. And uh, clinical trials are flowing through the system. So this, this number in the lower right corner, 7,000, is the number of opportunities that our members received through this network to consider participating in clinical trials. So it's really a very interesting uh, network to be a part of. So what I wanted to spend my time today is not to talk about any specific projects. We've, we've been hearing about amazing ones during the, during the uh, morning, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be more to come. Uh, I wanted to sort of editorialize a little bit on the, on the data and what, what I've been noticing in the last three months. So as Trinetics, as a company, we really mobilized very quickly to address COVID-19 challenges. We've done a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm sure none of it is particularly unique. You're all parts of organizations that have done similar things. We, in particular, set up this, these COVID-19 specific networks. So one of them is a network of sites that said, yes, I want to be considered for COVID-19 trials. Another one is a subset of sites that says, yes, I want to be able to pool my data with others in order to be uh, given access to a larger swath of data to look at COVID-19 patients. We've done and continue doing a bunch of webinars that talk about sort of best practices on how to use the network. Uh, looking looking at, uh, at this disease, we've been very transparent about the volume and the types of COVID-19 specific data we have. We've been distributing that information to our members uh, we're participating in N3C. I'll say a little bit more about this, time permitting. Uh, newsletters are going out. We're, we're distributing these reports, geography specific, that talk about particulars of the, the composition of COVID-19 patient cohorts on the network. And uh, I keep on getting these alerts from Google Scholar when publications mentioned in Trinetics pop up. And it's really gratifying to see papers from folks that have not reached out to us directly, that they're just using the system because it's available to them. And that's really the, the, point, the point of this exercise. Um, so counting cases is harder than, than it seems. And uh, yes, indeed. So I2B2 began with this humble uh, prospect of being able to count across patients. So instead of looking at one chart, you can ask a question that, that crosses the entire population. And it seemed, it seemed uh, you know, bare bones and basic, but uh, it is really important and it's foundational and it's the beginning of explaining to people that real world data is available and you can ask questions based on the data, but it is also really <laughs> difficult. Um, and we've heard a number of comments today uh, on this topic. I don't think I'm going to have anything uh, specifically earth shattering to add, but uh, so data availability. There are two aspects that we are working with our data providers on uh, very, very you know, carefully and in a sustainable fashion, refresh rates. So 
how recently was the data refreshed in their own research repositories and anything uh, upstream of Trinetics and obviously Trinetics itself. And for many common data models like I2B2 and OMAP, the question of refreshing ontology comes into, into focus. How, what, when was the last, the last time they updated the ontology? And it, it won't surprise anybody on this call that it is taking, it, it's not, you know, it's not an insignificant issue. It's taking folks a long time to make changes. Uh, to take labs as an example. So on the 12th of March, Loing released the first wave of special, code, special use codes. They've continued doing so about every couple of weeks uh, and more is expected to come. On the 18th, so our, our software release uh, schedule is every two weeks. So at the, next, at the next opportunity, we updated our ontology, we call it master terminology, with the new Loing codes. Uh, on the 19th, Loing held this amazing webinar explaining to folks what those codes are, how to use them. By the way, if anyone's interested, uh, go to loing.org slash pre-release and follow the links and then listen to that webinar. It's really educational. Uh, only on the 10th of April, the first US organization appeared on Trinetics Network with the queryable lab data. It really takes a while. And uh, you know, in this particular case, obviously the new code is a complication. It's difficult to integrate them end to end into the EMR, into your research uh, repositories of various sorts, all the way down to Trinetics. Even though we worked with people and we did not require loading codes, we helped to map them, map their local ones to loading, et cetera. As well as the fact that the majority of these tests, especially the, the ones that look for viral RNA, are reporting non-numeric results. So the result is, as you all know, detected slash undetected and all sorts of permutations and people being creative with putting in uh, textual results into those fields. But we're not used to dealing with that kind of data. In fact, many I2B2 instances just filter out any non-numeric text results, uh, test results. And so it, it is, it, it's, it's a substantive change. And so this, was, this example is just looking at labs, but there are obviously other examples. And I just wanted to emphasize that ETL is a piece of technology and a piece of legacy of ours that requires constant babysitting. Um, and so, you know, we came across many different examples for why the data is not there. And in many cases it was, well, it, you know, if you last refreshed in 2018, there is no chance that you will have COVID-19 data in your repository. Uh, if your I2B2 ontology that dates back to 2016, don't expect to magically be able to find patients with a diagnosis of uh, U07.1. Uh, if you built your ETL to reject records that are coming in that haven't been mapped in your stale mapping that, that you haven't refreshed in a while, well, all the new data, all the new diagnosis, all the new labs, are just going to be bounced off and uh, you might not even know. And I, I call it gating and this is something we've been sort of uh, battling against. Uh, we've heard all sorts of things, you know, my institution is using this slowing panel code for lab results. Well, that's not terribly convenient. Why not use the right one? Uh, we just heard this morning, my EHR simply doesn't have these codes. Well, especially for diagnosis, yeah, it probably does. This is, how, this is how your organization is getting paid. It's a matter of finding them and liberating them. And so obviously it's an ongoing challenge. Um, another, another aspect of, this, of, this, uh, of these three months has been this interesting realization that, uh, you know, we've typically, we've typically deployed this argument that, look, this is what real world data coming from EMRs looks like, right? For decades now, we've been, we've been collecting our usual, you know, diagnosis procedures, meds and labs, going a little bit far, farther afield here and there with vitals, with oncology specific data. But the core of what we thought of as the EHR data was pretty unmutable. And along comes COVID-19 and we're hearing all these nuanced requirements. We heard them before. We heard them for any uh, sort of specific use case, but we kind of rebuffed them. 
But now uh, that we're facing a pandemic and it's kind of dire circumstances, uh, I think we're beginning to realize that we have to go deeper. We have to think about nuances. Nuances are important. And uh, we have to really plan on transitioning from the low hanging fruit, from the structured data that's easily available to other nuggets of information that are elsewhere in, the, in our uh, source systems and uh, liberate them as well. And uh, with, with that limitation, yes, of course, we're enabling some science. We're enabling a lot of science, in fact. But this ongoing focus on infrastructure, this sort of constant struggle to get the data out and make it available hasn't abated. We're still sort of hitting that wall that's, that's still in front of us. Uh, another Matt, Matt, we have to move on to the next, uh, the next panelist. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. So can we pass it to, to our uh, next uh, panelist, please? Who is that? Is that Jack? Yes, that should be Jack. Yeah. OK, um, I'll share my screen. Uh, uh, does everyone see? Uh, oh, I have to say. Okay. Um, whoops. Okay. Uh, the, the slides are coming across okay? They look great. Okay, good. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking about a study that we started in early May, um, looking at cancer patient encounters during the early COVID-19 pandemic. And it sort of came out, I was using actually the platform that Matthew was just uh, discussing, our Trinetics platform. And I noticed that at Jefferson, um, cancer patient encounters fell off starting in March, of course, and then drastically in uh, April, and started to think about the implications that this has for cancer care, looking from this data. Okay, so we, uh, the, the focus here was not so much the effect of the COVID-19 disease on cancer patients, and, uh, um, but more or less um, those patients who had cancer-related diagnoses who were having contacts with institution, what effect was the pandemic, the mitigation efforts around the, uh, stopping the pandemic having on cancer care in, in general, starting from screening on through treatment and not so much the implications of the disease itself on the various cancer diseases. And so we used the Trinetics platform. And as Matthew was relating, you know, the platform may have many research uh, uh, healthcare organizations across it. However, this is May 5th, and we were looking for those who had refreshed their data such that we could get uh, relevant information um, on, on uh, cancer related diagnoses being seen in institutions, and that, that uh, through the end of April, through April 30th. And so, this then, because of when institutions refresh and, and actually considering the uh, upheaval that happened all across uh, the uh, healthcare organizations in this country and globally, how many actually could uh, you know, follow the normal protocols and have refreshed their data and have the information on cancer patient-related diagnoses and encounters with their institution, primarily through the uh, EHR data. And so actually, uh, 20 different organizations within the US uh, having 29 million uh, patients met these criteria that they had immediate data that we were looking for. And we, we gave this little subnetwork a name, the COVID-19 Cancer Research Network or CCRN. So as I said, we're focusing on CCRN patients 
who had diagnostic codes for neoplasms. Now, neoplasms can be malignant cancers. They can be benign or in situ. And so they have uh, the ICD-10 uh, code C003049. And, uh, and then we focused on a, uh, we analyzed data for a subset of, of that larger set of data, um, those who had malignant neoplasms and the corresponding ICD-10 codes. And um, we were looking at numbers, first of all, for comparison's sake, to last year. In other words, from uh, January through April of 2019, to compare it to what's been happening January through April of 2020. And by the way, this, this then adds to the constraints we had on eligible um, uh, hospitals in that they not only had to have a recent refresh so that we could look at April 30th, 2020, but they had to be a member of the network and have all their data in as of January 1st, 2019. And as well as looking at um, uh, neoplastic patients in general, we, we, we focused a little bit on those who uh, had diagnoses of specific cancers, melanoma, lung, breast, hematologic, and prostate. Um, additionally, because of Jefferson, we have a data use agreement with Plymouth Hospitals in uh, the UK. Uh, just for the heck of a, we took, we analyzed similar numbers there just to see if there was any confirmation, et cetera. And it's only a single um, non-US organization, so we're not making any, any claims for the UK or elsewhere, but we just did it for the heck of it because we could. Um, of the 20 hospitals, that we obtained data from. Interestingly, you know, 18% uh, of the Northwest uh, in April, New York State was undergoing uh, pretty severe there, and the West, et cetera. Um, for whatever reason, it turned out that 43% uh, of the patients are from the South, which had kind of a rolling increase in caseload. So um, if anything, we feel we might underestimate the effect somewhat. As far as the demographics of, of these patients, you know, the uh, uh, mean age, uh, 41, et cetera, there's a bit more females than males, 53 to 47%. Um, because there are 27% uh, um, uh, unknown race, we can definitely say that 14% were African, 14 were African American, 57% white, and 9% were uh, uh, Latin or, or Hispanic. Um, ethnicity. <clears throat> now, uh, to cut to the results, if we look at any neoplastic diagnosis, we see that encounters uh, compared to the same month in 2019, in um, uh, March, you start, start to see a fall off down, you know, a decrease in the number of patients seen at these organizations, about 25%, then falling off to around 57%. Uh, by April. If we look at patients with diagnostic codes of malignant neoplasms, cancers, we see, um, you know, the fall off is, is similar there, uh, you know, beginning in March and going into April. Uh, now, if we look at new patients, what I mean by a new patient, this patient had no prior encounter with the institution with the diagnostic codes we were looking at. Um, they are not necessarily newly di diagnosed patients. That information we won't have for several months until tumor registries make that decision as to whether they were initially diagnosed at this uh, uh, place. Um, however, they, they may be newly diagnosed. They may have had a, a prior diagnosis and are seeking a second opinion or they're starting treatment, maybe on a clinical trial at this institution. Um, so in any event, they fell off really steeply down in 70 some percent by April, you know, down from 25, 30% in uh, uh, March. Uh, looking at those who had diagnoses of malignant neoplasm, actual cancers, um, you know, once again, it's about similar, uh, 60, 70%, et cetera, by April. Um, taking a quick look at, at what was happening over Plymouth, uh, Plymouth we see similar trends, the trends uh, as we saw, be it all neoplastic patients or only the newly encountered neoplastic patients. 
Uh, cancer screenings. We look at the procedures for uh, breast cancer and colorectal cancer, mam mammograms primarily uh, for breast and in colorectal uh, uh, co 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 colonoscopies, as well as CTs. And um, we see a rather drastic effect. Uh, and that is they've, they've fallen off, um, you know, 70 to 80 percent, uh, 80 some percent uh, in April. And when we looked at, at certain cancers to see whether there are differences, uh, lung and the he 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 hematologic cancers, um, let's see, fell off around 40%, and the others, uh, breast, prostate, et cetera, were down around uh, 45, 50%. Um, we'd actually thought that maybe with lung cancer, you had patients coming in with symptoms uh, that could be lung cancer or COVID-19, and hence we're getting x-rays and CTs, et cetera. And so maybe that's why, well, we, we don't really know, but it's just kind of interesting the breakout there. It's not that drastic, but there is a slight differentiation between uh, different cancers. So the conclusions, cut to the chase. Um, ne neoplastic patients seen with neoplastic uh, uh, diagnoses fell about 60%, comparing April 220 to April 219, the number of New patients the scene even declined um, further, 74%. Um, screening, and this is very important, fell 85 to 90%. Implications for the future is there's going to be most likely an increase in new patients seen with later stage disease because of uh, uh, delayed screening and just uh, seeing docs, et cetera. For certain cancers, not all, it may lead to lower survival rates. It certainly is gonna put, you know, uh, oncologists are gonna be seeing later, later stage diseases. And also, of course, uh, when things open up a bit, as they are a bit in Seattle here, um, there's gonna be increased demand for screening, for mammograms, uh, you know, and other tests because of the postponed care. And just finally, uh, the group, and we've been really working hard because, as I said, it's, it's been a month's process, and we are going to submit for publishing, hopefully later today or tomorrow, uh, Chris McNair, who took over my group at Jefferson, uh, Elnara El Fazio, I'm not going to attempt her rest of her name, at Trinetics, epidemiologist, Matt V, you just heard from, and that's it, guys. Wonderful, Jack. Okay. Well, I think we now have uh, Sean and Doug presenting for the ACT Network. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Great. Um, just going to start the slideshow here. Um, so uh, Sean and I are going to tag team on the this um, ACT discussion. Um, I'm going to go mostly into the infrastructure, you know, as Matt Feig was referring to earlier, there's always infrastructure that makes these things, networks work. Um, and Sean will go a little bit more into the ontology and the data and some of the dis, uh, learnings that we've had so far. Um, so I think as many of you know, the ACT Network is uh, comprised of CTSA sites within the US. Um, there are approximately uh, 60 or so CTSA sites and we've engaged in one form or another with 57 of them. I think it says 42 contributing data, but I think that that number has gone up to 45 or 46 at this point. Um, and uh, that uh, the network has roughly 130 million uh, unique patients in it right now. Um, this network um, is implemented as essentially a production grade network uh, with 24 seven availability and real time query capability. Uh, the, uh, the, that infrastructure is built out of I2B2 and Shrine. Um, and um, as a result, uh, since this is production grade, a lot of our work to date has been um, in a separate test network where we could, where we could validate different kinds of uh, ontology improvements and data refresh rates and so on. Uh, the ACT organization has several different working groups. Uh, we have four PIs, uh, Lee Nadler, Steve Reese, Steve Reese is the prime, uh, Bob Toto, and uh, uh, get, I'm sorry, Gary Firestein in uh, UC, or California. 
Um, and they participate in some of these working groups, um, governance, regulatory, technology, data harmonization, and dissemination and evaluation. Uh, we work together closely and meet on a regular basis just to get everything well organized. Um, so uh, when uh, in sort of early to mid-March, um, the COVID-19 uh, crisis hit, um, we uh, decided to leverage the technology and the, the engagement that we have with all the CTSAs to start to look at a uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, updates within the ACT network to better address COVID-19 queries. Um, and uh, we were, were leveraging, you know, the, the governance agreements we had and the relationships and the infrastructure that was already uh, implemented centrally and um, uh, also at sites um, with um, sort of a coordinated um, ETL process and ontology implementation. Uh, and this led to a pretty rapid uh, process. So um, from March to now, um, we formed a team of uh, sites that are in, were interested in participating in this testing process. Uh, we recruited them into a COVID-19 test network. Um, we've taken several passes at um, improving the ontology, as Matthew and others have uh, noted. There has been a lot of shift in coding and so on, so we've tr tried to address those, including um, uh, derived terms that may be uh, accumulation of local uh, codes and things like that. Uh, of course, we do data validation once these ontologies are implemented and sites implement their ETL. Um, and this test network has been made available to a small group of researchers, primarily to validate that it is effective um, and um, as a result, we're planning for a production rollout this summer, um, starting next week, of uh, all the assets that we've developed um, in this test network. Um, sites who join the test network, um, as others have mentioned, uh, data refresh rates are critically important in an evolving situation such as COVID-19. So um, all these sites agreed to refresh their data at least twice weekly. Uh, almost all of them are actually daily at this point. Um, they agreed to be uh, responsive to ontology, new versions and so on, implement those at their site and within their ETL. Um, there's a, a minor uh, improvement to our uh, network agreement that they uh, agreed to that goes to the publication process and um, a fairly extensive data quality effort. Um, so this is the makeup of our, the COVID-19 test network um, that we have. It now has nine sites with over 30 million lives total. Um, you can see refresh rates and um, the data set sizes. When we roll out to production, everybody will be using it, uh, their full data set. And uh, as of a few days ago, we in this network, which was just the sites that were willing, it intended to be, did not intend to be sort of comprehensive in coverage. Uh, we had uh, 23,000 patients that tested positive and almost 10 times that number of the patients that have tested negative. Sean, I think this is where you start. Yep. And, um, you know, so the question is big network, what could go wrong? Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, uh, just to double down on Matt B's statements, which were very, very insightful. Um, so you, you start and there's a lot of very new kinds of data coming in. And so even defining what a COVID-19 phenotype would look like, right? Who is somebody who has COVID-19? At the beginning, we, we barely had any test results, but uh, as many of you know, you know, they've been actually tracking cases all the way back into January now. So was there a set of symptoms that maybe we could have been looking for or something of that nature? We didn't take that route, but that, that's something that, um, you know, the, what is the phenotype we're looking for needs to be considered. And then, you know, what do we need to do with the ontology? So clearly uh, when, when, when things start and you've got a new type of situation, you don't have an ontology that properly describes it and you're gonna have to invent one. And so we'll show you a little there. And then uh, we had to make this derived terms. And these derived terms became extremely important in our analytics. And we learned a great deal about how research really needs to proceed. And I'll go into that a lot in the next uh, talk. 
and then the prioritization of those derived terms once we determine them. So the next slide, I think you have to, thanks, thanks Doug, <laughs> um, uh, describes the phenotype that we, that we actually resolved, uh, which was, um, you know, those who uh, met the criteria in either having a positive test or one of these codes in ICD-10 or CPD-4. Now the problem is uh, you actually don't get those codes until you're discharged. So that didn't help that much. Um, the test codes helped the most. I really want to stay on this slide and direct you to this GitHub that uh, uh, Sham uh, Biswani has uh, uh, been making. And it has tons of ontology information. It has demo sites for you to open up I2B2s. It has the phenotyping that we're talking about. This is a great site to go to. This is the site that we used in 4CE in order to augment the ontologies in 4CE. So that is an important site. I'm gonna sit there for just for a sec so people can kind of copy it down. And now I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Now I'll go more quickly. So the first thing is, okay, so what kind of ontology are you interested in in, 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 in COVID-19? And we sat down and we thought about the course of illness and the different terms that would define that and what we needed to collect like intubation and mechanical ventilation. We thought about you know, what diagnosis codes existed, but mostly we talked, thought about laboratory testing and what we needed to do with laboratory testing. Next, next slide. And so just like Matthew referred to, in laboratory testing, you have all these different ways that SARS tests are being declared positive or negative. You know, positive, detected, maybe positive, all these different, different terms. And those are not really present across a network. Each hospital has a different set of basically handcrafted terms that they use to describe positive. So in the next slide, you can see what we did is we took all those and we made a derived fact where local, and this is the key thing, it took very, very hard work from the local participants at the various nodes in order to take their, all those terms and condense them into a new fact that we'll call a derived fact, a new fact that now everybody could use across the network that says Loink SARS-2 positive. Now in simple, that was the key element that enabled the network. Next uh, slide. And you can see we kind of really went to town then and we included these kinds of terms that grouped them into any positive uh, SARS test. Next slide. And now we could do some really fancy queries. Like we could say, okay, are there people who have, were positive, tested negative after 14 days, so they're really negative, and then became positive again? And that's still something that we're looking at. This is a very important type of investigation and you can do queries right in the, uh, you, 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 because they all have I2B2, you can actually formulate these scripts to do very complex queries, um, if you would like. Next slide. So basically, uh, what we learned was that ACT in, indeed was a highly dynamic system to ask new questions. It's respectful of patient and institutional privacy, so such that um, we can distribute queries and compile aggregate results without disturbing privacy. The local data expertise was critical absolutely critical to build facts and overcome that exact situation that Matthew described, which was ETL gets out of date, new things come in, how do you express them in a network ontology that people can then uh, access in almost 50 sites? And finally, largely this translates into data that can be leveraged for, leveraged for uh, clinical trials. Next slide. I think that's it. Thank you, Doug and Sean. We've got a lot of time because I, I want to recognize pretty much most of the people I'm seeing on the attendees list or at our conferences every year. And it's many of you who've made all of these networks possible. So um, we'll have questions for the panel from the audience and Diane and others will help navigate that uh, as well as uh, well, not just questions, but it'd be great to get perspectives of other people who've been leading this work uh, of how they've seen it. Um, while I'm waiting for questions to appear, we have one question from the chat box from Bruce Arnau. Are there red cap builds that have one-to-one -one mapping to the GitHub phenotype models? Uh, Sean? Yeah, that's a great question. So in fact, what we actually started with was a red cap form <laughs> where 
uh, clinicians uh, kind of designated what kinds of things they wanted to collect um, in an instantaneous clinical trial that they were essentially setting up. Um, I think it was a remdesivir trial even to collect from patients to, 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 to do symptoms and severity and so forth. Then that is where much of our insight into where then to try to create ontology terms came from. This relationship, I have to say, with REDCap as kind of a way that you can see how clinical trials and, and, and important data are being collected real time from patients and then try to model that in the electronic medical record is a critical concept. And you often see there's no one-to-one -one concept. You have to really think about, you know, what's going on in the red cap form, but use that as your guide, not something, you know, you just, because it's there, get out of the electronic medical record, because that's not always suitable. You often have to make these derived terms using some pretty clever logic sometimes, which fortunately our local folks were, were great at in order to understand, you know, what elements we could make that were truly relevant. And we're gonna really look at this very carefully in the next talk with Jeff and I, where we look at derived terms that 4CE came up with and how we can um, uh, use this uh, idea of severity. What's a severe patient? Simple idea, very uh, difficult to implement, but we can do it, test it, uh, see how, how, it, how it actually works in the real world, compare it to charts and et cetera. So um, this is a very important concept of you know, looking at what people are collecting in real life and emulating that in EHR kind of reminds you of C-DISC, but now we've got some local boots on the ground and that's what really matters. Thank you, Sean. Um, just to get the conversation going, I was struck by, at least for our organization, that we're really seeing what John Wilbanks talked about in the keynote, that we're having a lot of the same infrastructure with little augmentations for various areas supporting multiple commons, be it Trinetics for cancer, uh, the Cornet, ACT for CE. Do most of you, um, like if we look at, and then I would also say you have other tools like in the EMR system itself. I know Epic during this COVID uh, pandemic started developing and deploying a COVID registry themselves that you can take advantage of if you look at the Clarity data model. And I was just uh, love reflections from other people at Harvard and elsewhere, uh, how they manage this, challenges with managing multiple common requests. Has that arisen for people? I find you're kind of limited on bandwidth of how much you can focus on. I think it's a little tricky, even between 4CE and ACT, even though they're both I2B2 based. If you're busy trying to get your infrastructure up to speed, the more messages you're getting when they're all trying to achieve the same thing, it's just hard to hard to filter and know what to prioritize first. Doug, I know you support the ACT network as kind of a, a person building the network, but I think uh, Harvard is also, and Sean, you as well, Mass General are also kind of partners in these efforts. How has it looked like to you as institutions uh, participating in multiple um, commons? I'll let Doug go first and then maybe I'll comment. Well, so um, as a quick reminder, um, Harvard Catalyst uh, is based out of the Harvard Medical School and, and Harvard Medical School doesn't actually uh, have, a, have a hospital. We have affiliated hospitals. And so we work closely with people like Sean and Griffin who are in that community to understand sort of what the, the stresses and strains on them are. Um, uh, you know, as mentioned earlier, uh, I think there's been some good dovetails with like the ACT ontology development and being used in 4CE. Um, and we've had conversations with N3C about um, the, the fact that they're aggregating data and they're, I think, while they're trying to go beyond CTSA sites, um, if the data is already in an ACT uh, ontology driven I2B2, that it's actually pretty straightforward to pull that out and transform it the way they want. So I think we, you know, the, the short answer is um, there's been a number of sort of tactical opportunities to, to help people or help sites um, engage in various ways with some of these other networks. Um, I personally haven't had the challenge of ha juggling those priorities, but um, you know, Sean and, and maybe others in this panel or um, you know, uh, anybody who's in the ACT network can probably give some good guidance on that. I have to say, this, this was a great case study, let's say, of um, how research happens 
from the boots up. Um, and when, when COVID first struck, um, what we saw was actually many networks. And this, the, what we're presenting here is a tiny fraction of the network. We saw the New York U, U, University network. We saw uh, mass CRM. We saw tons of networks kind of starting to form but they actually weren't having an impact at the beginning. The impact was really coming from clinical trials that were being done. And so the idea really is, I think, in this kind of situation, how do you augment a clinical trial? How do you assist a clinical trial? Kind of translating what people kind of intuitively know that they should be collecting for a clinical trial into, you know, kind of the EHR equivalent. And very importantly, is that even possible? That is very, a very important question because, you know, just spinning your wheels doesn't really help at all. What you want to do is make sure that you can validate the data and make sure that, you know, what you're doing is actually providing accurate answers, which I think is something that, you know, was actually overlooked with some recent papers that people did. So, you know, get this, this was, it, it was very interesting how this evolved and how um, this relationship with people doing clinical trials, validating their data, them then validating our data when we, when, we, when we have EHR derivatives, which we think are similar to what the data that they're collecting, but maybe isn't uh, because of a lot of issues that are in EHR data, like Matthew actually uh, started to describe. Um, you know, these are things you have to pay attention to when you're doing science, which is gonna have a profound influence on the future of, of, of clinical care. And these studies that were being done have a profound influence. And so if you get it wrong, and you say hydroxychloroquine is working and actually it's harming your patients, you've killed hundreds of patients. Um, and so, you know, you really have to pay very careful attention and, and make sure you're doing it. I was thinking, like, Matt V, you see a lot of your customers out there part of these multiple networks. And then you made mention of the fact that ontologies could be out of date or their loads could be slow. Do you have work both with respect to the Trinetics platform, but then these other commons people participate in, in terms of what their latency is like and what their uh, data quality might look like? And has COVID changed awareness at all to enhance quality for uh, partners with Trinetics? I would I would answer I would answer in, a, in affirmative. So on those two aspects, on data refresh and data quality. Uh, both went up. We absolutely saw a number of sites heroically go to daily refresh schedule and everybody can appreciate that it's it's not easy because these just the process itself takes hours and if it's not written very efficiently or if it's going against a large volume of data or on, on slow infrastructure, it really might take days. Uh, we we're able we're able to take in that data but yes, so a significant uptick in uh, in refresh rates. Uh, a lot of sites went to weekly or a couple of times a week. We have a large increase in the ones that are doing about twice a week. There are still laggards. There are still sites who, who are finding it very difficult to marshal resources. And those are the ones who were harder hit in, you know, with resource constraints and furloughs. So that's just a sign, a sign of the times. They're not lacking the, the willingness to do it. It's just a, a resource constraint issue. And with data quality, obviously everybody is motivated. And I really appreciate Sean's uh, comment that, you know, about the, the importance of how this data is uh, handled and what conclusions are drawn off of it. Uh, we're really custodians of, of something that, that will be in the foundation of clinical decisions. Uh, and I don't think it's lost on anyone. We, we, uh, we're very cognizant of it. Um, so institutions themselves are trying to do a better job looking. And we are, I don't want to use the word harass, but, but <laughs> we are trying to be very insistent uh, about about the data we're trying to look at volumes we're trying to to do all sorts of spot checks and sort of straight face checks of the data that's coming in and uh, are very frequently finding ourselves in sort of a, a positive loop situations where we inform a site of something that doesn't look right and they uh, investigate and fix 
Thank you. That was really um, informative to hear that perspective because uh, it's neat your position. You can kind of look at across the different efforts and different campuses. Uh, while we're getting other people thinking, we have another uh, question in from the chat box from Andrew McMurray, who uh, said yesterday, Russ Altman talked about the difficulties in the US with COVID-19 conducting clinical trials and what has been the panel's experience supporting US trials during COVID-19. Uh, so while people think about that, I'll reflect just briefly on maybe one or two examples. I think one example has been for probably the non-hospitalized population when they shut down campuses largely that also shut down clinical trial activity in many cases. So one aspect was as there was that immediate closure of campuses largely for anything but critical activities, it kind of really put a damper on clinical research overall. Uh, then if I look specifically at the hydroxychloroquine trial, um, on the flip side, it was a dramatically quick response to actually create a trial and get it supported. I actually get drugs from BARDA um, that moved incredibly quickly, uh, but actually a little digression, you know, that has not been a non-controversial drug. I don't know if people follow the news. There's a very high profile individual who lives on a street called Pennsylvania Avenue who has a certain opinion. So, you know, it, it ebbs and flows, you know, so it's gotten kind of politicized. And so you got people rushing to sign up for the registry, then maybe not so much, then things come out one way and then they go back the other way. So I think uh, that's just been interesting to observe that kind of back and forth. Um, and I think for PCORNET's trial, it's very interesting that it's essentially going direct to provider via that registry is the first entry step. So it's an interesting model where people are being funneled to the website first and then they get into the trial versus other trial efforts where it may be driven by the provider of care for that specific patient. So I think that's an interesting comparison. Sean, I don't know how you've seen it up at, um, at your institution. Right, so you know, for clinical trials, um, they virtually came to a halt, but then uh, COVID clinical trials took up. And so you see this kind of substitution of regular trials for COVID trials. Um, it, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a perverse way, it reminded me of when we had the H1N1 and H1N1 took over all the old, you know, H3 and so forth flu. Um, th that's kind of what happened here. So uh, there, was no, there was no lack of uh, clinical trial activity. Um, and many of them were focused on, um, you know, collecting uh, samples as well from, from the patients. So there was quite a bit of activity going on at the hospitals. Um, What's really interesting now is that, so now everybody's going back to work, so to speak, right? And so a lot of the, the, the clinical trials are resuming. And what that means is that the bandwidth, a lot of, patient, a, a lot of uh, people were being borrowed from jobs that weren't, weren't happening um, to run these trials. And so, and now they have to go back to work. So now they, the, the intense amount of effort that it took to run the clinical trials because they were collecting data from every patient by hand is now falling off. But of course, the, the clinical trials aren't over yet, right? They still haven't answered their questions. So now they are really turning to us in order to, in an electronic fashion, um, come up with the, you know, the, 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 from the EHR, the same data that they were getting from, from the patient. It actually poses a really neat situation because we have all this, you can say, gold standard data, right, that was collected by the people doing the trial by hand which we can then go back and try to derive the um, data from the EHR and compare it to the gold standard data and get a pretty good assessment of the quality of the data that we're deriving from the EHR. On the other hand, it puts a lot of pressure on us because you know, now they're really expecting us to come up with something that's gonna substitute for that data that was being collected by hand. And collecting data by hand is still a pretty, pretty good way to, to, to get clinical trial data. So, um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a high bar actually to try to meet. Um, when you're when you're when you're trying to derive data from the EHR, um, but you know it just shows all the more I think um, emphasis on how important this work of being able to do research, very very careful research using EHR data really is, and going into the future how important it, it has become. Russ, yes. Uh, within the cancer community, there has been discussion about the effects. The uh, one one topic of discussion is doing consenting remotely, much more of an emphasis on that. Also, just the whole idea of conducting trials, less emphasis 
on the patient being able to travel to, let's say, the academic center, um, you know, and, and for instance, for the consultations, do it by video chatting. Um, so the, the thought is, yes, there will definitely be an effect on the conduct of clinical trials in the future within the cancer realm, which this hiatus of new patients being diagnosed and uh, you know, uh, starting up trials and everything is is going to have a real impact that's going to have to be dealt with. Yeah, you know, that's a good observation because uh, before COVID hit, um, PCORNET was ramping up to do a major trial for the NIH called Preventable that was going to test the impact of statins on cognitive function and cognitive decline. So we went through that process. Everybody's very excited. COVID lands. And then really a lot of people are rethinking and I mean, it's probably been said by many people, but the actual adoption of telemedicine and the prior reimbursement challenges kind of being overcome, I think are gonna really be exciting for clinical research and healthcare delivery in general. That's gonna be much more informatics driven with telemedicine that, that may be very refreshing, you mm -hmm. know, as well as the need for e-consent to reduce exposure. So that's, that's a great observation. I'm looking, keep the questions coming. That was a great question from Andrew. Um, I'll have one I'll throw out because it was touched upon briefly by Matt V. Sean and others, which is the role of natural language processing. Uh, so I'm going to pick on the 4CE group, Sean. You know, we'd be on all these excited calls at seven o'clock in the morning out here in central time. And I was always amazed at Doug Bell's in California and he's on this call. So he must have you know, he must be still awake from going out clubbing all night or something. But you'd be sitting there and you'd be thinking, okay, yeah, you're right. You know, I ought to get the symptoms loaded off of the notes, right? And Nor Abu uh, Rub, one of our uh, individuals, has actually got the notes available to do that. And we'd start implementing different NLP algorithms. We wound up settling on MedTagger by Mayo Clinic. But then I don't, you know, we got it as a sidecar set of data to I2B2, but we haven't really weaved it in because you're trying to follow instructions and it wasn't clear from a PCORNET standpoint, you'd wanna load that data. So I guess my question to, to the panelists is, do we have a sense of if anybody in these large commons effort has kind of NLP elements integrated and tag that way in their ontologies so you can know that yes, Mayo Clinic has it and they're participating in these three efforts where the symptoms uh, like lack of taste is one where it could be recorded in a structured sense, but when we looked at the actual notes, you, you know, really got that a lot more from notes data. Is there any sense of how many people are actually doing NLP off of notes as part of these collaborations or is it 90% still structured data? So, so very briefly, I can, here's an interesting thing. So it turned out that forget symptoms and all that, knowing if somebody was in the ICU turned out to be most reliable from the note because we had like uh, uh, people were saying the ICU was like all over the place. The hallways were being made into ICUs. They weren't being called ICUs in the record. And so um, the only reliable source turned out to be the resident saying transferred to the ICU in the note. So that's our, that turned out to be just that basic NLP was very important. Was that in a note or in the order, like uh, an order? We, we were looking at the notes. We were looking yeah. at the progress notes. Interesting. Yeah. Latvi, have you, has that come up for Trinetics or from the people you support? So we run an NLP program of our own. We have on-premises, so on board of our appliance, uh, an NLP processing pipeline from a company called Averbis. And uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of work with it. It's actually, it turned out, so we, we started looking at COVID-19. We started early on in the pandemic. And uh, it was not trivial. So, you know, your usual diagnosis, it, it typically does a pretty good job with, with the usual synonyms and uh, uh, rule-based approaches to extracting information. COVID-19 was so prevalent and the context uh, in which that word appeared in the notes was so varied. You know, somebody's aunt was concerned about COVID. It, the system just couldn't couldn't deal with it tremendously, uh, you know, effic efficiently. So we're actually still we're still in in the process of trying to figure out how to uh, how to make the to make the most out of NLP. Obviously, looking at other data types, so for example, medications, it it does a, ma a much better job. 
And then from the perspective of M3C, they spun up a separate working group looking at NLP. And so there's pl there are plans in the future to incorporate unstructured data in, uh, in the data asset that M3C will collect, but that hasn't happened yet. I, as far as I know, there haven't been any asks to any participants to actually provide uh, narrative text data. Jack, have you seen any efforts in that space from a cancer realm? Well, we've been working with Trinetics and uh, with Matt V uh, for a while now. We've uploaded pathology reports, um, et cetera. But as, as Matt V points out, um, uh, nothing much has been done related to COVID itself. Mainly, it's training on pathology reports and, um, uh, you know, the oncologist notes and that sort of thing. But we haven't switched over to emphasizing uh, COVID. Actually, we have a comment. I'm not sure who's best equipped to answer from Andrew about are there any plans for an I2B2 or I guess N2C2 competition for COVID? Any word on that? And it looks like Andrew Williams is responding. There is interest in the working group with Hong Feng Lu leading that effort. So, um, Sean, in your example where you said you know at Mass General you were picking up on ICU status based on NLP, is that something that a user of the I2B2 ontologies would be obvious to them that that was how it was derived or it's all sleight of hand under the covers? So, you know, um, it, it, the way that we actually picked up on it using I2B2 was so we can query text, you know, I2B2 can allows you to query text um, if you have it loaded. And it's not doing NLP, it's doing you know, regular expressions. But fortunately, um, and it looks for the negations around it, I think eight words wrong that use the regex and that's about, it's, it's that simple. Um, ICU, I guess, turned out to be a particularly good uh, example because everybody says ICU, nobody says intensive care unit or intensive unit or anything like that. Everybody uses the three letters ICU and, and you won't find them any other places in isolation. And so you can compare that and you can pull ICU off of the menus where people are charged for being in ICUs and so forth. And you can say, okay, how many people, you know, intersect, right? And you can see very clearly that ICU was getting um, a much, the, the word was getting a much better, you know, a much greater population than, than, than folks who were um, uh, just getting the charge code. And then you could look at things that you actually, and, and you'll see later, we'll actually show some of this. You, you, we, you could, get things that people get in the ICU, right? Um, you know, they get blood gases and so forth. And does that correlate with, you know, who's being described in the notes as being in the ICU? And that was very highly correlated. And so we actually took that pretty far to try to figure out, you know, what the sensitivity and specificity or rather the positive predicted value and ne negative predicted value were for that. And it was, it was pretty good, actually. Um, it was pretty good. Any other questions from either panelists to other panelists? So one of the things, one of the things I was wondering if I can uh, ask others on the panel to comment on is this whole notion of federated versus aggregated uh, approaches to data. You know, it's a panel on networks. This is something that was on uh, on the last slide uh, that I wanted to pontificate about. But you know, we've been we've been building federated networks. Uh, mainly because this is the regulatory environment we're finding ourselves in, and that's that's a good technical solution. But now during the pandemic, we're seeing this push. You know, N3C is a good example where kind of the first reaction to to the requirement to get the data fast and make it available is to build an aggregated repository. So I'm wondering what what are people's uh, thoughts on this? How do you think? this will continue. Are we staying with federated? Are we going to pay much more attention to the aggregated data idea? What are, what are your thoughts? So, so Matthew, let's see if it works, right? They can, you can get a bunch of data together, but let's see if it works. Why wouldn't it work? Well, it won't work, perhaps, because of this exact example that you gave with the test IDs. So they're going to get all the tests in. They're going to have all this crazy text associated with them. Nobody's going to know what that means. So unless you have local knowledge to map that into, you know, a positive test or a negative test, it's going to, you know, it's going to fall apart. And I think there's, there, there's many instances like that where you need, 
people at the hospitals to curate your data, essentially. And that happens more naturally with a federated system than it does with an aggregated system. It could happen with an aggregated system, but you'd have to organize it that way. I think it's a blend of both, Mavi. You know, I think um, all this time, you know, it strikes me after coming from Vanderbilt to Kansas and really getting involved in data sharing, it's been explosive how much even federated activity we have since I came in 2010, you know? And so I'm, it's just exciting to see how far we've come as a community. I agree with Sean, like if you look at the rapid reaction of the federated network to very quickly pick up a network like 4CE or Picornet to get people actually pushing data back, I think that's much quicker than creating an aggregated resource. Um, either aggregated or federated, being in touch with people who can go back to source data is important. Uh, but I think where they are often complementary that we see is you may have certain efforts where if you're linking to claims data, you may need to link to the common claims data or you're federating a lot of query activity, but then for a specific project, somebody wants to do a data pull and link de-identified data and have it in one spot because they need to really immerse themselves in data. We found for some PCORI characterization of solid tumor data, it was really best to get the data aggregated in Iowa to really wade in the data. So I think some of it's sometimes you're limited on one approach versus the other due to governance issues. Uh, but if you can live in a world where the two are complementary, it's, um, it's the best. But uh, as Sean said, and I think as the Lancet retraction points out, if you just think you're buying data or using data and you can't go back to talk to people who got the data together or you know that those people are curating their data, um, there is peril. Um, as well as if you're a data provisioner and you just kind of throw it over the wall and you don't think about it, um, if there's no opportunity for you to engage with the users of your data, um, you can be also in a misleading situation. Jack, how have you seen it with the cancer world? I mean, there's been a lot of efforts like ASCO and, and many, yeah. many years in this space for cancer for decades. Yeah, but, uh, you know, with, with ASCO, with Oncolink, as, as well as, you know, with the other uh, networking efforts, it's been federated and, and it's been driven a lot just because of the regulatory environment and everything. Getting, uh, even in a federated environment, de-identified data up is, is very challenging at times. And, um, you know, the, uh, the aggregation, uh, you know, as, as others have just said, I mean, you, it has to come with a certain amount of curation, and, and et cetera. It isn't just a case of dumping the data over the wall and being done with it. So, um, I don't know, in the cancer world, uh, you know, I, I see the environment as being, particularly with the EU and everything, as uh, getting away from a federated model would be very difficult. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for all the presentations. And thank you to the audience for listening in and also feeding us some questions. I think we have the next uh, panelists uh, or individuals uh, ready to present on the next topic. Thank you again, Jack and Mafi, Doug and Sean. Good to see you all. Great to see you too. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, Russ, for coordinating that. Um, that, was, that was a really um, wonderful panel. Um,